Welcome back to Bible study. We just about got into Acts chapter 3, uh, which is where we're going to start today with Alan, Fun, Ian Bell. Evening, Tim. It's good to be back together in fellowship with the Apostles' teaching, if not the breaking of bread. Uh, we have prayer. So we're going to read the first 10 verses, but we might refer back. Yep. And, and Alan's going to read. Okay. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, P Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Lord, at the very beginning of our Bible study, we would ask for a quietness of the soul, that we would be aware of your Spirit's leading. And we pray, Lord, that your Spirit will touch our hearts and illuminate our minds so that we might perceive wonderful things from your Word. We pray, Lord, for those who are watching this program at this time and maybe they haven't been to church for a few weeks and they're seeking a special blessing from you. And I pray, Lord, that you would just anoint them. May they feel your presence in a fresh new way. May they know that they're loved by you. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for those who are older now, who seek to be faithful to you, who are studying the word of God, and have been faithful in years past. And Lord, we just want to say thank you for them. Thank you for their lives. And we pray, Lord, that they may uh, receive a blessing from you uh, as they study the word, as we study the word together. Amen. 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 Just before we came on air, um, Ian was humming the tune. Peter and John went to pray. They what? met a lame man on the way. Walking and leaping and praising God. That's right. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's right. So we used to have music <laughs> in Bible study. Yep. Now you just got to put up with a couple of old, yeah, couple of <laughs> old out of tune. Singing. Yeah. So um, this is a classic. You were saying last week, Ian, about what what is needed. And I, I don't, there's some, I would say rather than what is needed is what happens when it happens. And it, it there was a mention last week I, in the passage yeah. about miraculous signs. And this is almost inevitable when there's a revival. But do we live in an environment That's the point. in which this stuff happens? No. No. And somehow other... Christians, <coughs> I'm not blaming anybody or anything, but we've kind of lost the edge. Mm. We've kind of lost something. We're, we mentioned last week about materialism, and we ended last week we're very quickly going through this thing that the, the, the 3,000 did, which was to sell everything they had and not even consider that what was theirs belonged to them and they had everything in common, and everything took from the pot as they had need. People weren't acquisitive, and it's in that environment. And Peter and John had nothing, because nobody 
carried wads of cash around in a materialistic, acquisitive way. So they genuinely had nothing. And the beggar looked at them expectantly, expecting them to give, them, give, give, give him some money. And they were as poor as the beggar. Yeah. Possibly the beggar had a few coins by then More than that them. other people had put in his cup. Yeah. But they had nothing. So they said, we, we don't have any of that stuff. Mm. But then they talked about what they had. Yeah. And they said, we want to give freely what we actually have. Mm. You know? I mentioned at the end of, of last week that I, I had a near miss with this. It was basically an, an Cult. end times sect. Right. Um, you know, they loved God's word, but it was very much you, you give everything and it does create a, a sort of level of, of commitment and fellowship that you don't get otherwise. And my, my, one of my brothers actually did join and he met his wife and he, did, and he left, as it were. But there, there, there is that challenge that's out to us. Uh, you know, what level of commitment do we have to each other? And I remember when we, we, the channel started and we did the early trips to Israel, we... It was quite tantalizing because we thought the, the Lord was giving us a vision to set up a Christian kibbutz on the northern shore of Galilee. <laughs> and um, we got quite close. There were 60 dunam of, of land and it was a, an old holiday camp that was pretty tired and defunct. Uh, and <coughs> I won't give too much of the game away, but I went with Howard to, to meet the owner. And, we, you know, it really seemed like, wow, what a wonderful thing. You know, we've got all of these wonderful viewers. We could just all go in together and everyone could, could have a pad. You know, there were, I don't know how many of these holiday chalets. Um, but it wasn't to be because Pat Robertson came out with a statement against, um, against Ariel Sharon because he had given back Gaza. And then, the, you know, the, the goodwill that there was to do this sort of started to... To fade away but all I'm saying is it's a wonderfully exciting thing and maybe it's only when we get to heaven that we really can experience this you know not having any hierarchy based on money because our modern society is pretty well locked in to status is dependent on money I know and I Whereas think Peter and John it was a completely different frame and I think there's, there's something to be said for the old monastic system yeah. Uh, people swore vow of poverty, for lack of a better term, and they joined a monastery and everything was shared. And they did all the digging and the planting and the sowing and the reaping and the wine and the pressing and everything. You know, and they ate commu communally. You know, and they wore the monks' habits and things. Uh, and then they prayed. They read the Bible and they prayed, irrespective of, you know, where your theology is. Yeah. At the very least, they read the Bible and they prayed. Yeah. Yeah. And never considered materialistic things. Yeah. And, and the Lord provided. The Lord provided yeah. and most mon monasteries now are defunct. They're ruins. And actually, don't, well, partly to do to Henry VIII, but, um, uh, but I... You don't actually need, when we strip everything away or all of the, the tinsel and tat of the modern world, you actually need food, shelter and clothing mm. and family. You don't actually need all the other stuff, but, but we've, we've sort of fallen into it. But that was last week's Bible study a bit, but there may be another I, I'm, I'm being a, I'm being a little bit out there. mischievous here, but yeah. um, when you've... When you've got plenty of money, <clears throat> money's not important. Yeah. Uh, it's when you haven't yeah. got any money. And I know of lots of people and in my ministry, mm. people who've really struggled to, to, to clothe their children and to feed their children. And, mm. Well, that's my point. But that's the point. That's but the but point. we, we, yeah, I, I think... The, I think there's two things. One, I think this is a pattern for the church that we should be caring for each other and and but it's we have to be very careful not to actually then expand it and say this is a pattern for society mm -hmm. because 
I think I think we we would be better if we cared for each other more and we shared more and uh, we paid more taxes and we had we you know we we had a better uh, you know social care system. It was a kibbutz system. Yeah, yeah. It did work. I, I think we I think we'd be better there, but but we have to be very careful that we don't impose something. It's this was voluntarily given. It's it's people saying this is what I want to do and this is the right thing we do. And incidentally, you know, the the early forms of socialism, and not, I'm not talking about communism or Marxism, the, the, the co-op and things like that came out of Christian, Christians, Christians' understanding, feelings, though you've got to share and put back. And I yeah. think that that's a Christian value yeah. that we've lost. And, 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 and you know, I, I think we, we, we would do well to go back and rediscover, rediscover uh, the, this. And the, 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 the point I mean is I'm struggling to actually see how, how we are faithful to this in the church situations we find ourselves in today. Um, I, I, perhaps one of, the, one of the things, looking back, I, I, I think that buildings, church buildings became too important and became more important than the people. And I think if we spent less money on our church buildings mm. and more money on caring for people, then I think that would be more akin to, to, yeah. to, to what's happening here. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to apply it because it's not directly applicable because, you know, in those, you know, for example, later on we'll read about the care of the widows and things like that. It's not quite the same thing, you know. The, the taxation system wasn't the same as mm -hmm. as our taxation system. They, you know, you know, you know. For example, most of us paid twenty five, you know, percent of our wages mm -hmm. uh, every every month mm -hmm. to care for our society. For our society, that wouldn't have happened then. No. So, so, so. But it's become institutionalised. So yeah, this it's become was very inst much voluntary. Yeah, but wasn't what, it? what I would say that in a church situation, I think that we have to be more focused on people, and and we must be have set up systems to care for people. Mm. <laughs> and the best system is uh, the, 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 the problem. Best I've, the problem I've got is I've tried this so often, <laughs> and I end up in a mess. <laughs> I end up in a mess because the the people who 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 are the who deserve the help more help are the people who won't come forward, but the people who really don't they're, they're in they're, they're in, in straight in, away in and, and, it, and it's so so hard yeah. uh, to get it right. I you know I've, as a pastor I've tried more than anything else to, to I've tried more than anything else not to be, be focused upon money to be focused upon people. Yeah. Um, but it's it just so hard in today's society. Mm. Well, definitely, you know, Peter and John could have just walked past and said, yeah. well, actually, we haven't got a penny in our pocket. Yeah. You know? And obviously he's asking for money. Yes. And we don't have it, so we yeah. don't have what he's asking for. Yeah. <coughs> it's interesting. So they, they stopped. Yeah. It, sorry, just a side. Interesting. The previous chapter, it just said we shared everything. In common, yeah. And then there's a guy here who's outside of the church. Yeah. And they said, the basically, church. no, but, well, I'll give you something else. Yeah. Well, they said they didn't have it. Well, yeah. So that's interesting, because the sharing in common didn't... They didn't cream off the top, did they? <laughs> they, they didn't actually enrich themselves with the prosperity gospel on the back of everyone else giving. They probably... They probably Did you read something it. into the Bible it doesn't say? <laughs> 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 Me? No. No, I, th th there is no sense in which they creamed off 10% or whatever yeah. it was yeah. and sort of said, right, we, you know, so. we need this money. They, they, they just didn't even carry cash with them, basically. But they, they shared where the need is. And this is the thing. In this passage, by the Holy Spirit, they were able to focus in, hone in, directly into where that man's actual need is. He's asking for money, but he needs something else. He needs salvation. Mm. He needs healing. He needs wholeness of limb. He needs to be reconciled to God. 
he needs to rejoice and give praise and thanks. So how often do we look at people and we take at face value what they say they need? And in fact, they don't need that at all. Mm. But we need the Holy Spirit. We can't work it out with our own minds. Yes. And it's as the Holy Spirit leads. And how does the Holy Spirit lead? What are the circumstances? They were on their way to prayer. Mm. Mm. You know? So the more time we devote to prayer, the more fruit, I believe, there's a, there's a message in here. As long as it's not, we're not in the story of the Good Samaritan, where we're on our way to prayer, but, you know, we go on the other side of the road. <clears throat> Absolutely not. Um, we, we meet people's needs where they are. Mm. We don't bring them here and say, come here and listen to the gospel. We go there and say, I perceive a need. Mm. Could I just um, throw something in? I'm sort of slightly challenged by what um, Ian has said. That I, I think I'm right. There are 300,000 homeless in the UK. Um, so while we're sitting here, you know, enjoying our, our Bible study, okay, we're only drinking water, by the way, but it, it, there are 300,000 homeless. And the, you know, I don't know how many thousand folk are watching us, but it's, I think there is a challenge here to us that we, these people really need the Lord. And that can often be the thing that unlocks whatever the issue is. It's a marriage breakdown or it's a financial collapse or whatever else. And we've all met folk on the street and engaged, uh, as I have in conversation even recently. And um, I, I found that they are more open and interested generally speaking, that if you're on the streets as a few years ago with my neighbor go, going down with the guitar singing choruses, you know, outside the shopping mall in um, Margate, um, no one's interested. <laughs> Not in the slightest. They all shuffle past and they just think you're a bit quirky. But the homeless come up to you and they're the people who are open to talk. And obviously the drunks and the drug addicts and all the rest of it. So I, I just wonder whether we could put a challenge out to all the folk watching Bible study to say, you know, if you see someone in need, let, you let, let the Lord and the Holy Spirit lead you to, to see what you can do to help them. Yeah, that's it. Pray and and the, me the message is here. This is it, you know, that we're actually, all we can really offer them I'm not saying that we don't help them financially, but all we can really give them that's of real value is, is what Peter and John gave them. Yeah. Mm. I hope people heard that, because we might just, just sort of sweep past, you know, to the next chapter. But I, 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 it's a real issue. 300,000 are there, homeless in there, this country. Yeah, I know. And, and, I, and I struggle with this. I mean, I... I, I, I I'm really convicted about, for example, children who are in, in, in countries where they are suffering so much mm. and, and the kids, you know, like our, you know, three or four year olds who are on the street and are hungry and things like that. Uh, and for the first time in our lives, Janice and my wife and I have decided that the major part of our ties will go to help, not the church. But but people, yeah. you know, like like that. So to try and to try and help. But having said that, I agree with what you're saying. In the end, changing the external is only a partial answer. Mm. It's it's not unimportant, but it's right. a partial answer. Yeah. There has to be a, a change. I mean, there there are. I think there, there, are, there are churches that are doing wonderful work among, among the homeless. Mm. Um, there are churches that are doing, uh, well, an organization is doing a lot of work among um, um, the um, drug addicts and trying to give them. Because these days, I mean, I had a relative who became a heroin addict. Mm. And there was no support for him whatsoever mm. in, in, in um, mm. 
outside, what he needed in order to be taken out of the situation and helped. And it was very difficult to get him help. Eventually he did get help, but it was very difficult to get him help, and that's, that's missing. I, 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 was, I, was, I was thinking, I was listening to Newsnight recently, and there was, a, uh, there was an article on, on about um, uh, young people uh, as young as 12 and 13 who are being put in these b basic houses, you know, uh, because they, you know, they have, they can't, they've got no homes to go to, and they're being put in to fend for themselves. They, there's no, there's no warden there, there's no support there. They're just left there that to fend for themselves, basically, in the house. And and the guy who was doing it, uh, who who was was raking in from one house. 70 to 80 thousand pounds a month off the council off the all the different councils yeah, all yeah, over yeah. the all of the country and i was yeah. thinking to myself our, our whole our society has fallen apart and, and i was thinking as christians really we should be doing that mm. you know we should be doing that and it's not as though i mean we we could do it for half the price put right. have committed people inside it mm. we should be doing that looking after these children giving them uh, stability in a in in it, Do you know what? The society, I, I, I just give the example of the vegans' homes yeah. that I know. Yeah. They, they basically, it was a wonderful Christian ministry, and it's yeah. still going, but yeah. they used to have the children's homes until yeah. uh, the government required them to stop praying with the kids. I know that. I, I, I know. I, <laughs> you know, so you can't win, but know, when you've got I a secular it's, humanist it's state, a mess. they it's, hate it's the a Christian mess. It's charity. a mess. I'm not, I'm not down it, but maybe we need to be cleverer, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, we need to be cleverer and, and, and we need to say, you know, uh, the, you know, the, you know that, 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 okay, we won't pray with them and we leave the Holy Spirit to, 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 uh, sure. to, to, through the witness of people who care and sure. that they will ask questions, but but I'm think I was thinking uh, really Christians. we should we sh churches should be doing that we should mm -hmm. we should be we should be setting up houses, and we should be it was actually yeah. incidentally a Muslim guy who mm -hmm. was who was doing this you know yeah. and uh, um, and and I, I, that's no no well they 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 the giving yeah. arms is very yeah, exactly important part of it but but but. We should be doing that. We should be caring for children. And it's a terrible situation. There's so many dysfunctional families now where children and young people just get chucked out and they end up on the street and they're vulnerable to paedophiles and all yeah, sorts of things it. like that. Yeah. And you can't just give them money because it feeds no, no, a drug no, habit but, or whatever but, else. But, um, but, but uh, were, in the last century, we had Bernardo and, uh, and, and we had all... George all, Muller. George Muller, and we had all these people with vision. Even, you know, Charles Spurgeon set up his own... Spurgeon homes and things like that and yeah. we, we maybe need to rediscover that that again and yeah. maybe there's someone uh, listening who know who has the skills and yeah and the vision do it, and the vision to do it and yeah, yeah. absolutely okay I mean uh, I don't, I don't, can, can I can I look at um, yeah we can talk can about I, the miracle eventually but yeah can we can yeah. I can I talk about healing and, yes. and introduce this subject of healing yeah, because okay. because um, I think I said last week I feel uncomfortable with healing meetings, but I believe uh, uh, that we should pray with those who are sick and pray the prayer of faith with people. And the pattern is, uh, in Scripture, is anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. Is any one of you sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And if any has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, that, that is, you know, that's wonderful. But the problem is I found in churches that people go and they take James chapter 5 and they say, right, we'll, we'll do James chapter 5. And they're not, the person who's being prayed for is not healed. And uh, the prayer of faith will heal. It's you who haven't got the faith. If you had more faith, you'd be healed. It's not me. Mm -hmm. hey. However, why are we not seeing healing? That was a question that was raised. Why are we That's not seeing healing? Verse 16 says this, Confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, the context of healing is that the elders go forward in, in, in representing the, the church, 
praying for healing. But behind them is a righteous praying church. Mm. And if the church is unrighteous yeah. and there's sin there and there's That's division right. in there, you will not see it's healing. Just a, it's just a charade. It's just a charade. Yeah. So, Alan, your turn to speak in this Bible study. Um, well, just picking up yeah. what Ian said, I mean, it's clear from uh, Acts chapter 3 that it was Peter and John's faith that healed the man, not his own faith, yeah. because he didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> but they were operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And this is, um, this is why people, I'm not saying it's wrong, but the, the church prays for revival because during times of revival, this pattern is replicated yeah. again and again and again. Yeah. And you only have to read accounts of uh, previous revivals. And this does happen. And there have been revivals with many, many miracles yeah. of healing and things. That's what revival is. I just, I just wish that we, we Christians had more of a revival mindset, mm -hmm. rather than sort of saying, right, there are times of revival and there are times of now, which is not, and therefore we have no expectation. I think we need to maintain the momentum, we need to maintain the expectation. Otherwise, how will revival actually come? Yeah. The revival comes through our faith and God's faithfulness. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a virtuous circle. And we just need to occupy a zone that we're seeing here, which perhaps we are not. Mm. And so, we, I, I heard um, David Wilkerson uh, preach once. And he says, lots of people talk to me about revival and lots of people express, you know, needing or wanting a revival. He said, I'll tell you how to get a revival. Number one, switch the TV off. <laughs> now, I shouldn't be saying this on Revelation yeah, TV, no, obviously, right. but you know what, I, I know what he means. He's mm. talking about secular TV. He's yeah. talking about all the diversions, yeah. all the things that Christians get into this habit and instead of giving themselves to the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, the prayer, and it's in that environment there is revival. It's in that environment there's these healings. And we just need to get back to basics, get back to doing what the good book says. Yeah. You know, no bells, no whistles, nothing. Absolutely. It, and yet, it's, it's so simple that we were, we're looking for a more complex solution in some respects. That's right. And you, you do need these sort of pioneering, visionary, charismatic leaders, as it were, to, to help push us into it. As a kid, I used to go to the Don Double mm. revival tent meetings. And, and yeah, there's a real... Uh, a complete atmosphere of faith and of course there were there are healings and you, you, and he's left a great legacy uh, but I don't see anything like that now Dick Saunders the revival meetings of, of Dick Saunders you know th these sorts of people you know putting a tent up in in the on the village green you know and all the churches getting involved well that's uh, another clue Yes, when was on. the last time churches got together? Well, they do churches together. Well, okay. But it's not for this, it's not uh, for revival. It's, it's, I don't know, something's happened. It, it, I, I actually think it's the social gospel. It's just, it's just a drift to this, um, uh, to a gospel other than, you know, salvation by faith. Mm. And, and that's why people say, well, what's the point of that sort of thing? Uh, even what's the point of preaching? You, you know, we should, the church should be doing good. So it's, it's sort of almost the counterbalance to what we were talking about earlier. I, um, I, I was involved in Billy Graham crusade. Yeah. I was converted, but then I was later involved in them. And when we were doing missions, we used to uh, plan for 10 or 15% response. Yeah. And, you know, people who yeah. would come for either giving themselves to the Lord or rededicating themselves yeah. to Christ. Mm. Um, and we would get that. 
you know, you know, we would run out of material usually at the end of the week. Yeah. Um, now, in later later times, we were doing missions and we were doing the same thing. And um, and actually, I think it was the last Billy Graham meeting. We never saw any response like that. Mm. And I think it comes down to the 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 post-war, if you like, the baby boom generation um, had a a foundation of biblical teaching. So when you were evangelizing, you were actually knocking at an open door, yeah. or pushing at an open door, uh, and and a lot of the 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 lot of the things we were preaching on, they would understand yeah. the concepts. They would understand. Yeah. They would, you know, a simple concept of of, of repentance, of of feeling guilty. Yes. You know, things like that. Now, That's I think I think today. Mm. I think today you've got to start a long way back, mm. uh, and that and and to be fair on people who are evangelists these days, and there are some brilliant evangelists. I mean, J. John is outstanding, yeah. you know, really. And I've heard some fantastic preachers who have been brilliant. And and if they were a generation ago, they would be having these big tent meetings and things like that. But things have changed. The I think so. Things I think, have changed, and, yeah. and so we've got to evangelize in a different way. But yeah. ne nevertheless, we've got to evangelize. Probably this is more akin to our day and age than 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 uh, than, than, than the Dick Saunders, Billy Graham. Yeah. Funnily uh, enough, I don't know. I th I think that Peter. You know, in this Jewish context, there was this biblical awareness. Yeah. Um, but Paul at Athens is probably where we're at today. Yeah. So we cannot presume that anyone knows anything other than that there's an unknown God. Yeah. That's the best we've got to work with, that there's, there's just some unknown about dark matter or dark energy, you know, we just don't know, it's, it's out there. And somehow we've got to, as you say, we've got to go to, the, we're in this sort of Greco-Roman, secular humanist, yeah. mythological framework that has no knowledge of God. Yeah. We've got to somehow find within that something yeah. and then steer them back to the creator. And I honestly think that that is the missing element. Yeah. I, it seems yeah. ridiculous, you know, in chapter three of Acts that we, we're talking about, you know, Acts 17, but it, but it is where uh, we're at today. I mean, people are hungry, and we, and they, I mean, I went to a, get my, a flu jab, and I, I went, my wife went in, she was in and out in a minute, you know. I went in, and, and the, the guy immediately said, oh, what did you do before you retired? And I said, I was a clergyman. He says, oh, are you one of these people who can tell me about God? And I was in there for 25 yeah. minutes, but my wife thought I'd collapsed out of you know, a needle. Uh, 25 minutes, and there, and she, he was hungry uh, 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 to know about God. And then my wife, the next day, she went to the hairdresser, uh, and the hairdresser w was talking to her and asked her about all sorts of questions about the occult and spiritualism mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and she'd got mixed up in that, but she was hungry. Yeah, that's and the, there are opportunities given to each and every one of us all the time. And we've got to be willing right. to, to, to act upon those op opportunities. Yes, we haven't got the Billy Graham Crusades, and I'm sad for a generation who never experienced these great revival no, meetings. Absolutely, yeah. uh, but, but there are opportunities today which God will give us and gives us. Yeah. The, the, this guy... <clears throat> was sitting just outside the temple, yeah. asking alms of people going into the temple to pray. Yeah. Now, because he was crippled, yeah, there, were, there was bits of the temple he wasn't allowed to go into, mm. but other people were going in. So therefore, he calculated, he'd worked out that people who go into the temple to pray are likely to give alms because that's what people who worship in the temple do. They give alms. So he had some notion of the belief framework of worshippers. Mm. But we're in this transition now, and I think going forward, we're not going to be living anymore in an environment where anybody has any inkling yeah. all right, of our belief system, whether they subscribe to it or not, at least the guy knew about it. Mm. Yeah.
Mm. Yeah, I don't go, we're going to be in a position where they, nobody knows. So the previous generation, they may reject the gospel, but they know what it is. Yeah. They know the language, as it were. They know the framework. They, they know the concepts. Mm. Yeah. Now we're dealing with a completely brand new generation mm. that knows nothing. Yeah. Uh, the, the clue here is, of course, he, he says to the man, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you know him. Um, yeah. so, so there was Christ. a knowledge. So, so Christ, as the, you the, mentioned the, the last week. Messiah. Yeah. So the man has an understanding of what the word Messiah is within the, the language. Yeah. Uh, linguistically, yeah. That says it all. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. He, they knew he was, about he sin. Was, they knew about... Linguistically, he was literate. Yeah. But now we're encountering a whole generation of, of religious words. illiteracy. Absolutely. And biblical illiteracy and deliberate, I, willful illiteracy in the media. I, I, I know that there are folks out there who really do know and they are willfully driving you know, an agenda away from mm. what is traditionally Christian. And it's tragic. It's so sad because it's, it's, at the very least it's harmless. Mm, yeah. um, and, and it's at the very best, it's life transforming and it is tragic. It's, uh, it's one of the most grieve, grieving and grievous things that has mm. happened in our time. Mm. But the one thing we do have is the link between Yahweh, creator of life yeah. and healing and wholeness. Yes. And if we can get that, if we can get to that place, where we do go and heal. Mm. And that conversation, that dialogue completely opens up, as we'll see next week when we go into yeah. the, the fallout, as it were, of this guy getting healed. Yeah. I, I think we have to learn as Christians to communicate to people where they are and what they're asking. Yeah. For example, if we were confronted by this, we would probably be saying, get our four spiritual laws out and then take them through this, mm. you know, and define what sin is and the, you know, Jesus is the bridge between and things like that. And we'd have to go through, through all this process of bringing a person. Whereas, you know, uh, you know, Peter and John met this man where he was and his need and allowed space for the Holy Spirit to work. I think a lot of the time when we witness we, it's not wrong just to, if someone is talking about forgiveness, you know, wanting to forgive, is just say, well, you know, I find it hard to forgive and the Lord Jesus Christ has helped me to forgive. It, that's enough to witness. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go and explain no. everything about the Christian gospel, that's what right. sin is and things like that. You're actually meeting people where they are and answering the question. Mm. There's, there's a famous saying in Liverpool, this was, those were people, um, um, uh, you know, people, uh, a church in Liverpool put outside the door, uh, Jesus saves. And some person in Liverpool and said, and this is it, but Stevie Jarrod, Jarrod always gets the rebound. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I think, I think yeah. a lot of the time we're, we're, we're actually making statements, answering questions which people are not asking. We need to listen to people and listen to their needs. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, you know yeah. what, are, what are they actually asking for? What are they asking Absolutely. for? Absolutely. Um, but also feed the flock. Yes. So, you know, so yes. we've got we've got sort of few few responsibilities uh, that, that that we have. Um, where should we go further in this passage? Hello. I don't know. Do you want to read on, or do you? Yeah, I thought I think maybe we could re we could read on because we 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 can get into a ritual of, of sort of forensically studying every verse. But this this is a fairly clear cut story that we've covered. Um, right, well, where should we read to? Because it's going to um, lose on. Uh, maybe up to another five verses or so. Yeah, do, have we really covered this? Um, um, <laughs> so, so they recognised him as the same man. I mean, I mean, there's a little bit of sort of historic authenticity in this, isn't there? Verse 8, verse leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple, walking and leaping and praising Peter and John. Yeah. No, it didn't say that. No. Praising 
God. That's him. In other words, P uh, Peter and John were making sure they under he understood who healed them. Yeah. And by, by incidentally, linking Jesus Christ to God, which is interesting in itself, pointing him that he is the Messiah of Yahweh. Yeah. It's just, there's something about this, when you get the historic narrative, he was sitting here, he was beside there. I, I'm thinking it could be on, on the way to the pool of Bethesda on that side, on, on, the, on the east, but I may be, I've forgotten. I should know. I should, I should know as well. I, I, I'm, um, yeah. But I think it's, it's a very authentic story. That, that when historians look at the, our scriptures, even if they don't believe, they say, well, they do have a ring of truth in, in the narrative and, and the way things are described. And that is good. Yeah. Okay. Just you know, it says taking him by the right hand, you know, he helped him up. It, it, it's the, the restoration of his feet and the ankles. If that hadn't have happened, he wouldn't have been, you know, jumping around. Um, anyway, we can read on, but I just the, thought... The, the, the one I've got here equates the, the beautiful gate to the golden gate, the one we talked about a few weeks ago. Oh, about. it equates it to that, doesn't yeah. it? Oh, so it is on that side. Yeah, so it's, it's on the it's eastern it's on, side. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, before we go on, yes. leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple. Now, before I said, you know, certain people were excluded. What the law actually said was, um, in Deuteronomy, is talking about eunuchs, all right? It, the, the actual word is crushed testicles. Mm. Uh, people, men who, you know, can't have children effectively are barred from entering the temple. Mm. Also, the Levitical priesthood, if they're blind or maimed or uh, crippled in any way, aren't allowed to serve in the temple, okay? But what was actually happening, as far as I can work out historically, is by this time, they were actually excluding lame people from actually entering the temple. So the effect of healing wasn't just the healing. Mm -hmm. He was able to go into the temple yeah. to worship God. Up to yes. this point, he had to worship God insofar as he wanted to worship God, yeah. to the exclusion of temple worship. Mm -hmm. So the, the miracle didn't just heal him, it enabled him to, get to participate yeah. and go into the congregation. Yeah. Okay. And that's the powerful thing about it. The, um, the miracle isn't just for that man. Yeah. It's just such a powerful sign for everyone. No wonder there, there were so many hearts that were turned. You know, it, and it's, it mentions the miraculous signs that we mentioned last week. It, it is, it's a powerful validation of the message, isn't it? When someone who is in great need that, 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 is ab healed. Absolutely. And the other thing is, testimony. Once the same man who was never allowed to go into the temple is inside the temple, inside the precincts, people are going to take notice. Mm. They're going to start asking questions. You know, and that's the backdrop to, you know, if we do go on um, and, and read the next few verses, mm. people are looking at him and pointing and saying, he's not allowed here. Well, wait a minute, he's walking. Mm. The walking would have come, in a way, it's almost like the, the walking came second to he's not allowed here, but this is out of bounds for him. Oh, whoops, uh, yeah. why is he here? Yeah. And by what authority is he here? The beautiful gate is on the eastern side okay. of, of, of where the golden gate yeah. is yeah. now today. And uh, the one we discussed about three or four weeks ago. And it was the entrance into the court of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. so, so basically everybody would be passing, passing through, by, passing yes. into that gate. And it's the way, it's, it's the entrance into the furthest part where Gentiles could go beyond that. Um, Okay. The only, only uh, Jewish. It's a key point, isn't it? That everyone, everyone would have seen it. Would have been. It would have been a very busy gate. Mm. And incidentally, mm. it's probably the uh, the court of the Gentiles is where the, the stalls were as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. And that, and the court of the Gentiles. That whole wall was an invention of Herod, wasn't it? Yes. It wasn't Solomon. It wasn't part no, of Solomon's. That's right. No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I was thinking also of where 
the Lord was crucified was also on that busy road, uh, which is now the, the, the Nablus Road at, at Damascus Gate. It was an absolute thoroughfare, so everyone yeah. would see it. And that's why the Romans wanted it, but the Lord had other ideas. Now, as the layman who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. Mm -hmm. So, when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Question mark. Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and kill the Prince of Peace whom God had raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So P Peter Brilliant. was straight into Back the, to the point. offensive, as yeah. it were, mm. and preaching. Yeah. This is the thing. He straight was so to, primed. Yes. yes. And he didn't pull any punches, and he just spoke in a language they understood. Because that's what people need to hear. It didn't, he didn't need any sort of backslapping, you know, that the, he knew that is what they needed to hear, and he took the opportunity. Yes. Yeah. And there's that verse, of always be ready to give an account, Counting. and that's, what he, that's Peter, yeah. absolutely on the ball. It's brilliant, isn't it? And because healing is associated with God, he starts off by saying, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Yeah, grounded. And didn't say, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob healed the man. It says, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has glorified Jesus, his servant. Yeah. I, I feel very strongly that we, yeah, we do have to reach out to folk, but we have to basically um, create the story. We don't have much time, but there's a, there's a historic root to our faith. It hasn't... We're not just sort of going around sort of stoned, you know, with some concept of God and, you know, and peace, man. It's, there's a, a wonderful heritage, you know, that's rooted in history and going right back to creation. And mm. um, frankly, what most folks are living off today, uh, you know, the, the secular humanist alternative, you, you have to really look hard to see what, where's it coming from and what's the source of it. And, is it, and I think it's worth doing. I think it's worth, if people are prepared to listen to it, just comparing and saying, well, do you want this sort of Greco-Roman, you know, source and origin to your existence? Or do you want the, you know, this incredible um, story that goes back 4,000 years to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob of God's mm. dealings with man? Peter is not afraid to be direct. You delivered him up. You denied him. Mm. You know, when they said, we want Barabbas. You denied him in the presence of Pilate uh, when he was determined to let him go. You denied the Holy One and the just, asked for a murder to be granted to you. In other words, you rejected God. Yeah. You did it. You rejected God. Mm. So, so he wasn't afraid to confront people mm. with, with, with their actions. And, and quite often we, we pussyfoot around and we, we, we imply You might not have another chance. It, it, we imply something yeah. sometimes, yeah. But, but sometimes we need to be very straight. I'd read the following verse because it, it just is brilliant. Verse 15. Yeah, you killed the author of life. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> it's just you killed, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whom God raised from the dead. I mean, he got it all in, that one yeah. line, yeah. the fisherman. The Holy Spirit does use directness. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. quite often we're not as direct as we should be. We are 
my, my, I, I was taught never to use you in preaching, always use we. Mm. And mm. yeah, looking back, I understand where he's saying, in other words, by using we, we're identifying with people instead of standing three foot above contradiction saying you lot here, you lot here. But in a sense, as long as we are, we're not actually saying, look, I'm better than you and you need, what he, Peter wasn't saying that. No. He was actually being direct. He was saying, you're in a mess at this moment in yeah. time, right? Because of the way you have behaved, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, what are you going to do about it? Don't blame God, don't expect God to bail you out without something changing. An acknowledgement. An yeah, acknowledgement. Absolutely. An acknowledgement. And I think that's, that's sometimes, that is, that is uh, sometimes, I mean, I've been in a, <laughs> a marriage counselling situation mm. and uh, when I was trained up, I was... I was Don't uh, make it a long anecdote. No, no. I was trained yet. to be non-directional. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I, and I tried my very best, but I wasn't very good at that non-directional. But I remember one uh, one uh, situation where the wife was saying, "I'm going to leave my husband, and I'm going to do this and that and the other." And I'm, I said basically this: I said, "Okay, you're going to leave your husband." I said, "Are you are you prepared to live in a, a small one-bedroom flat? Because that's all you're going to be able to afford when you divide up your things. Are you willing to?" Be unhappy for the rest of your life and lonely because you won't get married again. You probably won't get married again. You know, and, so and actually, and, and actually, she stopped. It mm. made her stop because yeah. she had this idealistic eye. You know, sunlit uplands yeah. of what it's going to. And sometimes we need to be direct in our counsel. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I do think, like old Fizz, not old Fizz Thompson, but our friend Fizz Thompson, when someone was blaspheming about the name of Jesus. She told them that name is very precious. Yes. And that's the modern context. People are disregarding the Lord, but that's the route to salvation and healing. See you next week.